And now we'll just have that brief delay that Facebook is so famous for before we go greet our mighty mystery fam, our friends who are so excited to hear from you today. Yay. And we are live. Welcome, mighty mystery fans, friends, and family. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am absolutely thrilled to host the incredible New York Times bestselling author, Lisa Unger, on the eve of her pub day tomorrow when Confessions on the 745 comes out. Lisa, welcome to Mighty Mystery. Tell us about your book. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're so wonderful. So yeah, confessions on, of course I have a copy right here. What author would not have a copy right next to her? Um, yeah. So confessions on the 745, when it opens, we meet Selena Murphy and she is a young mom and she's had a really, really, really bad day. And so of course, you know, when she gets on her commuter train home, it dies on the tracks. And so she's sitting there in the dark and there's a woman sitting next to her and the stranger strikes up a conversation with a confession. And so I don't know, maybe it's the dark of the train or maybe it's the drink that she shouldn't have had or the horrible, horrible day she's had, but, but Selena winds up sharing a dark secret of her own, something that she's never told anyone. And then the train comes back to life and she's headed back into her world and she's embarrassed. She thinks, why did I do that? Why would I ever share something so dark and secret with somebody that I had never met before. And she hopes that she's never going to see the stranger from the train ever again. But of course she will. Oh my gosh. Well, you, know. you are a master of suspense, the master of the twisty plot. And from that very first scene, I was immediately hooked in for all of the reasons that you list and a few which we'll leave out. No spoilers here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've all had that moment, right? Where you're traveling and you meet yeah. someone and they tell you something crazy or you tell them something crazy in the intimacy of knowing that you're never going to see this person again. I, people have told me some really crazy things on buses, on trains, on airplanes. So from that scene, yeah. I was immediately hooked in and there is something about that. Like you said that, you know, that, that, that magnetic moment where you're like, you know, you can just be free to share <laughs> thinking you'll never see that person again. Of course, poor Selena isn't to be so lucky, um, but you draw us in from that very, very first moment. And the, I have so many, um, I want to welcome everyone who's watching on Facebook. Hi, if, you, hi, if you've been here before, you know the drill. And if you're new, here's the drill and welcome. This is your time with the incredible Lisa Unger. And this is your chance to ask her anything you want to ask her about her writing process, her incredible body of work, how she does what she does her adorable dog jack jack anything that's weighing on your mind this is your time with lisa just go ahead and type those questions in the comment box and i will get them over to you and she's going to answer them for you today that's what we're all about here on a mighty mystery now i know it always takes me a minute to think of my questions so while you're thinking uh, gail uh, gail one of our top community members is saying it but it isn't tuesday gail you're so right we say Mondays for the big celebrities, and that's why we're thrilled to do Celebrity Edition with the incredible Lisa Unger today. Um, so let us know where you're watching from and what questions you have for Lisa. And again, it takes a minute to type. So while you're thinking, while you're typing, I have got to share just a few of the incredible, incredible rave reviews that Lisa is getting. So Lisa earned a starred review from Publishers Weekly and Booklist Four Confessions, Publishers Weekly Raving, Diabolically Clever, an Exquisitely Crafted Psychological Thriller. Exquisitely Crafted is the word. This book is amazing. I was lucky to get an advanced copy, and you guys have got to buy it today through our very special um, partnership with bookshop.org, and it will ship to you tomorrow when the book drops in the U.S. Book list also awarded this a starred review, Raving Absorbing. Reminiscent of Strangers on a Train and the Grifters, Unger's novel pro provides a master class in plotting, master class in plotting indeed, and we are here for it. The New York Times Book Review has said this Unger writes crime fiction like you've never seen before, brilliant, 
And I could not agree more. Lisa Unger, you are absolutely incredible. The author of 18 best-selling novels published in 26 languages with millions of readers who love you worldwide. Thank you. Uh, we have so many questions pouring in. So tell us, how do you do this? How do you write an exquisitely crafted psychologically thriller, a psychological thriller? How do you how do you write a book that is that earns the praise a master class in plotting? Give us the four one one. I I don't know. I mean, I think if I sat down at my desk and was like, okay, let me sit down and write a diabolically clever master class in suspense, I would probably just be completely stymied. You know. Um, so, <laughs> I would probably like sit terrified at my keyboard. Um, but, you know, honestly, for me, every book starts with a, it starts with a germ, like some kind of an idea. And then that, um, that thought or idea, or it could be anything like a news story or a line of poetry or even a photograph, it leads me to kind of a swath of research. And then the best way I can describe it is if it connects me with something that else that's going on, you know, connects with something else that's going on within me, then I start to hear a voice or voices. And I follow those voices through my manuscript. And, um, you know, when I sit down to write, I don't know who's going to show up. I don't know what they're going to do. I'm not 100% sure what the book is about. And I definitely don't know how it's going to end. So I feel like in many ways, like the story is there and I just have to find it. And so that's how I have approached the writing of every single novel. I am positive that there's an easier way <laughs> to do it <laughs> because there are a lot of 3 a.m. wake ups. I'll tell you that, like, like I, I often dream about my work and, um, you know, I, narrative problems get worked out while I'm sleeping, while I'm on the treadmill. And then I have these moments where I'm like, oh, that's it. And then I'm back to the keyboard. So I'm sure there's an easier way to do it, but this is how I've done every single novel. And I'm not sure I could do it any other way. So for me, it's really just about sitting down, setting my intention. I write as early as possible in the morning, right before I do anything else non-creative. And, you know, I just listen to that, you know, to those character voices. And, you know, I sit down with the idea that today I can be a better writer than I was yesterday. And that is what drives me through every single day and every single novel. Oh, Lisa. So that's the short answer. <laughs> It's just that easy. <laughs> it's just that easy. Just open a vein and bleed on the page. Exactly. <laughs> Both your life and your sleep and your every waking moment and your every sleeping moment to your craft. Yes. And you two can do this. Just exactly. That's all. That's all there is to it. <laughs> well, I want to get into every single part of what you said because what you said is so fascinating in so many ways. So let's 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 get into the meat of it. So right. first of all, you're uh, I take this you're uh, you're uh, you're not a plotter, you're a pantser. Well, I don't like the I don't like the word pantser because it, it it has an implication that I think like is is not exactly the truth of it. I prefer more the idea of of a gardener. Um, this is something that George R. R. Martin talked about, and um, I've talked about it with some of my my author talks pals on Twitter. This idea that you know there's there's the plotter, the person who sits down and plots out every single thing, and then there's the gardener who basically plants the seed and allows the story to grow organically. And so that's more the way I see it. I mean, because I and also I think at the end of the day. I don't think it, I don't think the two processes are very different after all, mm. but it just maybe takes the gardener longer and you write the novel while you're, while you're plotting it, as opposed to the plotter who creates a scaffolding and works within that scaffolding. Um, and I know that, you know, you know, throughout um, the industry and, you know, every author that I have met, you know, kind of usually follow, you know, falls into one of those two camps. Um, and I'm not sure you get to choose it. Right. And I'm not sure that in, in both, you know, sort of ways you see super successful people in both camps of, of how to write. So I'm not sure that, you know, there's a, a right or a wrong, a wrong way to do it. But, you know, gardeners tend to be very like sort of you know, accepting of plotters, but plotters don't necessarily always seem very accepting of gardeners. 
I've, I've noticed, I've heard this. <laughs> but you have I've noticed I, that. I have noticed that. <laughs> But I think it's okay. However you write, I think that that is, that is the right way for you. That's because you're a gardener. Exactly. <laughs> if, you were, if you were a plotter, you might be throwing some shade at us gardeners. So exactly. I, I think I could barely contain my girlish um, glee because as a, as a gardener, as an urban gardener, I, I, this, this resonates with me. I feel this on a deep visceral level. This makes mm. sense to me. Yeah. And, um, and so first of all, I also never loved the, the term pantser because who wants to go around pulling someone's pants down? Not right. me. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I never really loved that term, but gardener resonates as, you know, cause a, who doesn't want to be a gardener cultivating and growing and tending right. these seeds and bringing them to fruition through their TLC, their tender, loving care. Um, also, it just makes sense. You plant the seed, you watch it grow. I, I get that in a way that I never really got the pantsing. So yeah, you have just blown my mind, Lisa Unger and, 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 and someone in, and Gail is saying, aha, so you're blowing the minds of people. That having an, uh, everyone's having an aha moment. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really kind of, you know, I mean, the pantser idea implies that, you know, you're flying by the seat of your pants, that you don't know what you're doing. And that is so not the case. You know, I have been, I have written, you know, 18 novels I've been writing since I was a kid. I'm like a lifelong lover of story. My entire education is focused on, you know, writing and the novel. And um, everything that I have done in my life has been in service of this craft. So I do, in fact, know what I'm doing. I just, it's not, it's not a, oh, you know, I didn't accidentally write 18 novels just by sheer, you know, seat of my pants luck. You know, I have a craft that I've honed and, and worked on for, you know, as long as I have been able to hold a pen in my hand. So the whole pantser thing de definitely is like a little bit like, yeah, I don't think you're quite, you're quite getting it because the gardening idea is that the seed is planted and then you are present for that every single day, watering, pruning, watching it grow you know, directing the, you know, the shoots, all of the stuff. It's a, it's a, any kind of gardening requires a, a, a certain amount of presence. And that's how I feel about my fiction. Oh, I love that. I love that. And it's so true. And I also love that it allows space for the organic and nature right. of writing of, yes. of, of, of that magic of not adhering to an unyielding, you know, structure of, you yeah. know, of whatever it's let, it's sort of letting that organic nature of the, of, of being in the flow. So yeah. does it flow places unexpectedly for you? Is it a faith led process for you? How do you balance following that and being in the flow versus, you know, making sure that you're keeping the story going, you're adhering to a narrative arc, you're working in all of the, you know, the tension points. How do you do all that? Well, I mean, it is an organic process. I mean, I like that, uh, you know, that, that idea of it. And so with all organic process, there's an ebb and there's a flow, right? So there are times when, you know, there are days when you can't stop the pages from flowing. And there are days where you just kind of, you know, spend some time at your computer going, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's going to happen here and you have to you know you have to have faith. it is an act of faith but again that it's just it's a faith in your craft and in your ability it's not a faith in some like sort of like that some magical force is gonna you know sort of help you to write your book it's a faith that you know you do know you do know um, the, the form, the form of the novel. And so I'm not one of the, like, there are some people that have very strict word counts and they're going to write that word count no matter, no matter what. I'm more like, you know, I'm going to be at my desk first thing as early as I can be, you know, hopefully before my family wakes up and I'm going to have several big creative blocks throughout the day. And that's how I'm going to, you know, write my book over the course of not of nine to 12 months. And so there are days when it's a flow and there are days when it's an ebb. Um, and, you know, I think that um, in some sense, you know, because I've been reading since I was a kid, I have in many ways internalized the form of the novel. It's just the way my brain works. It's just the construction of a story. The novel is, is my form 
um, short story as well. But the novel um, is my form and I tend to sort of, the stories tend to evolve. So by the time I, in, in a very sort of um, uh, understandable way for me, and so I, I definitely get to the end of that first draft in, you know, um, in nine to 12 months. And then I, I try to put it away for a while, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, and then go back to it and start reading from page one. So that first draft is, you know, that's me. That's the story. That's what I wanted. That's the story I wanted to tell. And then the second draft starts to be about the readers. Did it work? Did I bring my reader along on this journey? So there'll be maybe two or three drafts before I ever turn it in um, to my editor. And then of course there's another draft from there. So the writing of the story is an organic, um, you know, ebb and a flow, a process that takes a certain amount of time. And then in the editorial phases, that's when I start applying my intellect and what I know about the, you know, the craft and the genre and, you know, sort of ask myself important questions, you know, like th things like, okay, for every scene, does this scene advance plot or character or hopefully both? You know, so there are certain questions like that that are asked in the editorial process that I'm definitely not asking in the, in the first draft process. Oh, wow. Okay, so those, those process, those two stages are so different for you. This is so interesting. Um, I just want to say hi to everyone on Facebook. Judy Ginsburg, Sintimer, is saying she's watching, saying hello. She's watching from St. Pete, your fellow St. Oh, Peter. nice. Hi, St. Pete. Sharon Carlson person says, I love capitals. Your books, Lisa. Yay, Sharon, tell us which ones are your favorite and get your copy of the brand new one, which drops tomorrow. You're going to love it. Um, but yeah, those stages are so different for you. So the first one, you just write for yourself. And then the second one, you're going back and you're asking all those questions about you know, as um, Publishers Weekly and Booklist were saying, um, you know, master plotter. So is that when in that second stage, that's when you're thinking of the plot? No, no, no. And it's not to say that the first draft is a free for all. I mean, again, I think in many ways, you know, the, the process or the like was something that I know well that, you know, when I get to the end of the first draft, I'm usually I think we might be having a technical issue. That's okay. This happens during the pandemic. Wi-Fi is overloaded. Let's see if let's see if Lisa unfreezes. Okay. You know what's crazy, Mighty Mystery fans? This happened to us last time Lisa was on, and she's back. She's back. <laughs> um, so this this is you know this is life in the time of the pandemic. Lisa, you're back. Yay! Okay, Lisa's gonna unmute, and we're gonna get right back into it. Lisa, I was just saying, oh wait, you have to, you have to unmute down there at the bottom, at the bottom corner. Oh, I can see. <laughs> You're back. Oh my gosh, I'm back. Yeah, I was just yelling at my husband, the internet's down. But I think it's, <laughs> I think it's okay. <laughs> Life in the time of the pandemic, right? <laughs> uh, so you were saying it's not just a free-for-all in that first draft. Oh no, I don't I mean, I don't mean to imply that. It's very difficult to even, you know, even discuss this part of the process because it's so like sort of endemic to who I am and, and how I think about things. So, you know, there's always like the kind of the awareness, like when I, you know, every day starts with me reading what I wrote the day before. And so there's like a, you know, sort of a hook back into the story. And every time I'm reading something, I'm always rewriting it. So there's a lot of sort of inherent editing that happens throughout the writing of the of the novel as well oh wow okay that's so interesting thank you for giving us this inside glimpse into yeah. your process um alan says i love your bookshelves and your wonder woman poster thank in addition to, <laughs> in addition to your pearls of wisdom about writing of course yeah. alan good eyes on that wonder woman poster and i too was admiring your gorgeous bookshelves thank you uh, Tell with your brilliance um, Sharon Wilson Spee saying, I heard this book is awesome. I can't wait to read it. Sharon, you are going to love it. I got an advanced copy and girl, you are in for a treat and you can buy it through our link, um, through bookshop.org today and support our beloved independent bookstores. Um, so we'll be posting that link in the, uh, in the comments as well. Um, and everyone tell us what your questions are for Lisa. This is your time to ask her anything that you want and I will share them with you. Um, from the Thriller Suspense and Mystery Readers Group, Becky Braun Rhodes would 
is asking, what motivates you to write these awesome books? Um, she has a two-part question, actually, uh, and says, is your subject matter totally imagination or is it, quote, ripped from the headlines? Thank you for all of your books. I love them. Thank you. Well, I think, um, you know, it's never just one thing. I mean, it's not like just from my imagination and it's, most things are not necessarily in my case, like sort of ripped from the headlines. Although, you know, that initial germ, that initial sort of um, you know, seed for the book, it could very well come from a new story. Um, you know, in the case of In the Blood, it was something that I read in the New York Times Magazine. In the case of Beautiful Lies, it was a piece of junk mail. In the case of Confessions on the 745, it was like a piece from research that I had been doing for on, a novel, on another novel. Um, in the case of, you know, um, Under My Skin, it was a, it was a Jungian idea. Um, that had been kicking around in my head for a while. So it's always some, it's always something from the world, you know, um, die for you is because I was in Prague at the time when I started thinking about that story. So it's always either from travel or from, you know, experience or for something that I'm reading or learning about. That's usually where the idea comes from. And then from that point forward, my imagination will take over and you know, that's how the story unfolds. So it's kind of a union of, you know, real world stuff and, you know, things that I'm imagining and thinking about. Wow. Okay. Wait, I think we all need to know what was the other book that you were working on when you came across this piece of research, which inspired this other one. Oh, so I was, okay. So I was, re this was, this would have been for the stranger. Some I started with the stranger inside. So, okay. and then, and then, but to be okay. So about confessions, there was a piece that um, an idea that I had in my head for a long time that I didn't even know, I don't even know where it came from. It was this idea that I had heard somewhere that you can't con an honest man. Ooh, yes, and that, and that is a line that crops up again and again yeah. in so this book. It has kind of the ring of truth to it, but it sounds, it, to me, it's too simple, right? You know, it's too, um, it, nothing nothing in life or in human nature and the human psyche is ever simple like no, there's no black or white as i see it so i so it got me to doing some research about the psychology of the con artist and the psychology of the con yes yes and so i started reading a book by um a writer named maria konnikova and her book was the confidence game I've heard of that. I have not yeah. read of it. Yeah, and it's super interesting. And she basically dives in deep to, you know, famous con artists, their scams, the psychology, the people who fall for scams. And her basic her basic premise is that for the whole book is that no most people think that they're way too smart to ever be conned or scammed but scammed, but nobody is. Everybody is vulnerable to a good con artist because the con artist you know, a really talented one will know what you want before you even know what that thing is. Mm -hmm. And so my thinking about that idea evolved. It's not that you can't con an honest man. It's that you can't con someone who doesn't want something and everybody wants something. Well, I'm getting chills because there's a very powerful scene in your book where one of the characters, and I won't say who, basically <laughs> works her way through the, what you just shared. Right. Um, and it really made me think, you know, first of all, it made me scared because I thought, uh, yikes, have I ever met one of these people? Will I ever met one of these people? And, you know, the, and these watchers who are sort of watching and sensing yeah. what it is that people want and then, and then becoming that, transforming themselves into that. But, and, and, and I think the way that, that you um, set up the con and the way that you, in the book, the way the character sets up the con, the way that she thinks about the con and speaks about the con and becomes that is so fascinating. What I thought was also really fascinating was the sort of subtle winks that you also gave us about the people in the book who aren't the official con artists, but who may be a little bit dishonest in terms of, for instance, what they put on social media. So right. there's someone else in the book who is maybe the victim, let's say, of the, of, 
Um, <laughs> it's so hard to talk about all of it. <laughs> but yet she herself is not being fully honest, as many of us aren't, only putting, <laughs> for instance, the highlight reel out on social media, having a great day, you know, beautiful day with my family or whatever. It's right. so, and so I thought the way that you did that was really fascinating. Uh, yeah, that is definitely something, I mean, and it's come up again and again, I think, especially recently in, in the work, um, you know, the idea that of, of the, these kind of curated versions of our lives that we're posting on social media and how in a, in a uh, it's actually one of the book group discussion questions is that, you know, how many people are, are doing this? They're just posting these really curated versions of their lives. And then what's going on beneath the surface is usually very different indeed because you know life is lived between your social media posts right what you've man what you've had the wherewithal to sit down and crop and filter and edit and 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 write out your little caption and all that <laughs> that that took some work right that took some real intention um yes. to to put that put that little piece of yourself out there like it's something that you wanted people to see yes. and so i think that you know it in in some sense it is a little bit of a con it's a con in which we're sort of all complicit because we're all using social media in this way and it, which is not to say that every single feed is inauthentic or whatever, but I'm just saying that it can be and that there can be so many more layers and that, you know, beneath the surface of everybody's lives and that as long as we're sort of doing this, like what is the impact that we're having on each other? You yeah. know, like where you're feeling like, oh my God, I overslept, my hair's a mess, you know, the dog threw up on the carpet, like whatever it is, it's like you get on social media and like, there's your friend and she's like, you know, doing yoga at sunrise or, you know, on some mountaintop somewhere and you're like, oh my God, you know, but who knows whether her dog was just throwing up, you know, right. <laughs> minutes before or she was crying because for whatever reason, like, this is the, you know, these are the the things that I that I'm fascinated with and what I what I tend to explore in the fiction. And so I'm not so like I, I I'm I'm interested in the surface only because I want to know what what's under what's underneath, right? That's mm -hmm. really where that's really where I want to go. And so that and that comes across in techno the technology piece in this book, but it might be any other. It might be any other uh, novel, you know, sort of exploring whatever, whatever layers of existence, perception, you know, whatever. Ah, oh, yes, I love that, and I love the what the way that you said. I want to explore what's beneath. That's yes, you and me both. I love that. Yeah. Um, Sharon wants to know: Do you pick your own titles? So tell us the story of this title, and tell us about: Do you get to pick your own titles? How does that work? So I've had like no end, no end of title drama in my career. So the, I think the only way it works is this. If I love a title, my editor is going to hate it. That's <laughs> just that's just the bottom line. If I hate a title, it's going to be the title for the book. Like if I just put like... <laughs> So beautiful eyes, for example, I I did not love that title. Okay, it was just kind of a holder title, you know. It was like I lived with it for a long time, and I just didn't have another title. But that was the title that they wanted for the book. I was like, okay. Um, uh, and for the stranger inside, my original title for that book was the night jar. And the night jar is a hawk that hunts at night. And my editor was like, no, that's nobody wants that title. <laughs> I was like, but what? She's like, nobody knows what a night jar is. I was like, I know, that's the point. It's, in, yeah, it's intriguing. Really intriguing. She's like, no, it's not. I'm like, okay. And so um, we can't, and so then what happened, what will happen at that point is there'll be like a long list. I'll have a list, she'll have a list. We go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until somebody or both people go, oh, I love this one. But for, for Confessions on the 745, I'll hold it off too. Hold it up, um, hold it up all kudos and all credit has to go to my editor because that was that was her title that's what she came up with and it's you know it's a it's a fantastic title it's probably one one of my one of my favorites so all 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 hats off to erica my uh, my fantastic editor at parkrow 
Wow. Okay, Mighty Mystery fans, you heard it here first. <laughs> you heard it here first. Sharon's saying, I guess you just have to hate the title then. Hello. Yeah, <laughs> it's really, it's such a complicated piece of the, of the puzzle, you know what I mean? Because it really does sort of fall into, you know, it falls into the, mar into marketing, right? I mean, that the title makes so much, right. you know, it has such, it has, you know, um, such an impact. And so, you know, you really do, you know, I mean, it's your book. And if you, if I felt passionately about a title and I, you know, went to the mat for it, you know, I'm sure that I would, you know, get my title, but I, you know, the, the, the truth of publishing is that this is a very collaborative process. Mm. And you trust people to know, you trust marketing and sales to know, you know, to know the marketplace and to know what works. And so you really, I mean, I personally do listen to them and to their, to their thoughts and ideas, because especially at Park Row, I mean, they're just so talented. So I, you know, have a tremendous amount of faith. So I always try to work with them and would, you know, in any way I can. Oh, I love that. I love that. And thank you for this, you know, illuminating glimpse. Thanks for giving us the, <laughs> giving us the inside scoop here, Lisa. That's what we live for. Um, Gail, hearkening back to the junk mail, she says, so does junk, so junk mail does have a value then, ha ha. So tell us about the piece of junk mail that you got yeah. that inspired a book. Yeah, so I, um, so this was, uh, this early in my career, I was writing for, um, I was writing for St. Martin's at the time. They published my first four novels. And I was in between the uh, third and fourth book in my very first series, which featured around a crime writer by the true crime writer by the name of Lydia Strong. And so I was, I had finished my third book and was about to begin my fourth novel, or was like sort of somewhere in somewhere there. And um, this is actually before I had my daughter when I could actually imagine writing a book in between <laughs> other books. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, so I went out to the mailbox and there was one of those blue and white flyers. Um, you know, uh, we've all seen them. There's like an ad on one side and then on the other side, there's the age graduated photograph of a missing person. Yeah. And I saw this and I had this thought, um, what if I looked at this and recognized myself? Ooh. And then, <laughs> and that was the, that was the seed for, uh, for beautiful lives. Wow. So literally you went to the mailbox, you got this flyer and you had this thought that's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That is it's so cool. Thank you. Lisa. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> we have um, our next question from Judy Kodama. This one from Thriller Suspense and Mystery Readers Group. She would like to know what you are reading. Oh, Julia, good question. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, yeah, so I'm always reading. I am like a, um, I'm just usually have about three or four books going. Me too. <laughs> At yeah. one time, I'm just kind of a, you know, I just kind of move through um, uh, and eventually finish all of them and start another one. Right now I'm reading, um, I'm reading The Biggest Bluff, by, also by Maria Konnikova. She wrote the, um, she wrote The Confidence Game. And when I was talking to Jilly McMillan, who's not, another one of my uh, favorite authors, I just finished her book, which is, I was fan a fantastic thriller to tell you the truth, which is just out now. Um, so that's another one that I was reading. When I talked to her um, online, she had we had talked about the confidence game, and she mentioned the biggest bluff, and she had said, "You are just going to devour it," and I totally am devouring it. It's about her journey. You know, she was a you know she's a writer, a, a journalist, and she basically wanted to understand the world of high stakes mm -hmm. professional poker. Yes. Oh my God, I just read about this book. Okay, yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. And so she basically turns herself into a poker player. Yes. Like a very successful, you know, professional poker player. And um, it's all about the psychology of the game, mastering yourself, you know, the the difference between, um, you know, skill and luck and how much each of those factors play into a sort of everything in your life, like the things you control and the things that you don't and all that and it's just you know it's a for me it's a it's one of my favorite kinds of nonfiction books because it's you know it's super entertaining but it's also 
provides a lot of really uh, deep and insightful information about the about the psyche and psychology in this very like sort of gripping framework. So those are the so that's what I'm currently obsessed with. So can we expect something in the poker world coming forth from you? At some point? I have no idea. I, I, I never know that. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Until, yeah. until things turn up on the page, I don't know. I, I don't even know um, how they're going to manifest themselves in the work. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Sharon's saying this is very freaky. She has goosebumps. Uh, I think she's talking about the, I think she's talking about the wanted, po the missing person poster. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. That was Sharon. I totally agree. That was very freaky. I also got chills and goosebumps. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, we have just a few moments left with Lisa before she's going on to her next interview. So if you have any um, last questions, just go ahead and drop them. I'm just scrolling through, make sure I don't miss anything. Um, just go ahead and drop them in the box. Lisa, it has been just absolutely incredible to host you. We are so honored to have you here on A Mighty Mystery Celebrity Edition. Um, again, everybody, this book drops tomorrow, Confessions on the 745. You can get it through our special partnership with bookshop.org, which supports independent bookstores. Um, receiving starred reviews, earning starred reviews from book, book list and publishers weekly, um, earning absolutely incredible praise. Um, it, it just, just absolutely amazing to read this again, uh, publishers weekly calling it diabolically clever. I could not agree more. And the word diabolically is so great. Gail is saying <laughs> thank you. Gail, you're so welcome. Great to have you. Um, Booklist saying this is absorbing. Unger's novel provides a masterclass in plotting because it is so twisty. My God. Um, New York Times book review raving about your body of work that you write crime fiction like we have never seen before. Brilliant. Could not agree more. I also want to tell everyone Lisa received two two Edgar Award nominations in 2019, and that is an honor held by only a few writers, including Agatha Christie. <laughs> My God, Lisa, you are so incredibly gifted, so incredibly talented, so incredibly smart. I just want to remind everyone, this woman received two Edgar Award nominations last year, an honor held by only a handful of people, including the freaking legendary Agatha Christie. So we have been... <laughs> absolutely just so honored and so thrilled to have you here um and i just want to wrap with one last question saying um can you tell us your tips for aspiring writers mm. yes yeah, so i i and i'll say the same thing i always say to inspiring writers um, or aspiring writers is that there's a couple of things first of all no matter who you're looking at that's further down the road from you, somebody who's just published or somebody who's published a few books or a best-selling novelist or an award-winning novelist, no matter who you're looking at, at one point, that person was a writer sitting alone in a room at her keyboard wondering if she was good enough. Mm. So no matter who you're looking at and comparing yourself to, they're all, they were all exactly where you are right now. The other thing is that no matter where you are in your career as a writer, it never stops being about the page. It never stops being about the writing. And I think a lot of aspiring writers think to, to the, you know, the, the contract, like the big book publishing contract, that it's going to be a windfall, that it's um, an end to something. But mm -hmm. if you're lucky, all it is, is an open doorway to the writing life. And once you walk through that doorway, it is always and forever about getting better at your craft. It never stops being about that. Nobody ever came to your work because and stayed because you were a great self promoter. They come to your work and they stay because you gave them a book that meant something to them, characters that moved them, a story that transported them. They came to you and they stayed with you because you are a good writer, not because you're a good publicist. And so don't ever forget that it begins and ends with the page. Oh. Lisa Unger, you were getting so many hearts up over on Facebook. Judy, a, a therapist, is giving you lots of hearts. So I, know okay. this is, this is <laughs> I like it when the therapists are happy. <laughs> if you're getting hearts from a career therapist, you know you're doing great. And I know I got goosebumps because the truth and the authenticity 
And the realness of that, um, Gail Roosevelt saying life lessons here. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, I, we feel that we feel your truth. We feel your authenticity and we feel that, uh, you know, authentic heart, heartfelt, heart open space from which you're speaking to all of us. So uh, again, just the hearts are coming up so much on Facebook. Um, the incredible, incredible Lisa Unger, thank you so much for joining us here on a mighty blaze, mighty mystery celebrity edition. We have been truly grateful and blessed to have you with us today. And we are so excited to read Confessions on the 745. Congratulations. Thank you. I hope you love it. And, and thanks for having me on. You're fantastic, Sarah. You're a great interviewer. I just love spending time with you. Thank you. Oh, Lisa, I think you are absolutely incredible and I am so blessed to host you. So thank you so much. And I can't wait to have you back next time. Thank you. We'll, see, we'll see you soon, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.